Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I introduced Professor Ron two weeks ago. I'm going to keep my introduction very short today. Uh, Professor Ron is going to continue the series of three lectures on the three biggest, three biggest mistakes in professional speaking. And today we're going to hear about advanced stage fright or stage fright of the fearless. Uh, I'm a computer person, I like technology, so maybe I wonder, does Professor Ron mean stage fright 2.0? Something like that, right? That's what we're going to hear about today. So, uh, I'm really delighted that we're going to have this lecture today. Let's welcome Professor Rod. Thank you so much. Again, it's a great pleasure to be with you to address a very important topic. We broached much of it last time in general and discussed one big big fear. This is part of a three-part series. The three biggest mistakes in professional speaking. Last time we did part one, taking improper note of your audience. Improper note of your audience, if you recall, means either excessive reliance on notes or memorization, no notes, that can result in a very artificial or canned speech, losing all naturalness. What we stressed was that it's important to minimize note taking in order to establish the best rapport eye contact, and freedom with your audience so that your eyes are not away from your audience, your nose is not stuck, you are not giving a scripted speech in which you are dependent on the manuscript. If the notes are assisting you to do a much better speech, given a focus on audience, they're acceptable. but I would urge you to keep them at a minimum. Otherwise, it will no longer be your aid, it will be your crutch. Now all this is based, as we said, on the fact that modern research has more or less validated the insight that the great Greek orator Demosthenes had more than two millennia ago. If you recall, Demosthenes was a stutterer. Uh, and he was about to become the king of Greece. So he practiced day in, day out, with pebbles at his mouth down at the ocean to perfect his delivery. And he became the greatest orator along with Pericles, in ancient Greece. Asked at the end of his long life what had been the secret of his astounding ability to give great speeches before his audience and his courage in being able to make them. He said that there are three secrets to great public speaking. Delivery, delivery, delivery. We noted that modern research has validated that 70% of audience perception following a speech as to its success has to do with delivery. Only 10% content organization. Only 12% diction and language. 18% personal dress, but 70% delivery. So it's unsurprising that the three biggest mistakes in public speaking would be in the areas of delivery. First basic mistake, take an improper note of your audience. Remember, if you're going to be taking and making notes, take proper note. Second biggest mistake, what I'm calling advanced stage fright. Yes, let's call it stage fright 2.0. 
This is subtle because it is the stage fright of the so-called fearless. The ones who believe they have no stage fright. But they do. What does this kind of stage fright consist of? You see, this is not stage fright 1.0. <gasps> Paralyzed because you've suddenly forgotten what you wanted to say next in your speech. Remember, that's the problem of the biggest mistake, where you've dispensed with your notes, you've memorized everything in a linear consecutive way, but you've lost your place. You can't remember what comes next. You're paralyzed. Or, if you're too dependent on the notes, take an improper note, let's say your notes are out of order, you have note cards, suddenly you've skipped a point in your speech, you're panicking, you know it's wrong, but you're reading the wrong note card, what are you going to do? Oh! That's stage fright 1.0. That's usually the stuff of nightmares. Stage fright 2.0 is much more so. What does it involve? It is not excessive reliance or no reliance on notes, but rather excessive reliance on another kind of crutch, a podium or a lectern. Many people will stand behind a podium or lectern, but they do so out of fear. Fear. How is fear a factor in choosing to stand behind a podium or lectern? That would not be apparent. That's why I'm calling it advanced stage fright. It's advanced stage fright for two reasons. One reason is logistical and the second reason is psychological. And usually, the second biggest mistake is related to the first. That is, if you have a lot of notes, you'll tend to want to use a lectern or a podium, where you can store your notes. But even if you're not using notes, many, many speakers make the mistake of still using the podium or lectern. Why? They justify it because the auditorium is large, or there's a microphone at the podium. That's why I always advise you, Always. If the room is large and it's difficult to fill with your voice, you put on a mobile mic, a microphone that will be attached to your tie or your blouse, and you avoid then the first problem with the dependence on the podium or lectern. What is that problem? The logistical problem is no movement. You've deprived yourself of a major resource that you possess, the ability to move and connect with your audience. Now, frankly, even the layout of this room that we're in presently is not good. You see how this table is blocking me from you. Almost half my body is unavailable to you. That's the second aspect of the stage fright. You see, the first one is, I have this big object in front of me. I'm protected. You see? I can stand behind it. I know what to do with my hands. I keep them hidden. I don't have to move, and so I don't have to worry about doing anything embarrassing when I'm moving. Advanced stage fright, you see, is when you're pretending to yourself that 
this crutch of the podium or lectern is necessary to an effective speech, when in reality it is your anxiety or fear about freeing yourself from this obstacle that's blocking you from the audience. It is limiting or even prohibiting your movement and even your gestures because you will not have the full range of your hands nor the movement of your body. That's the logistical problem, but it has psychological consequences, and that is the other aspect of the stage fright. That is, keeping yourself open and available to the audience without anything blocking you and them, including this table, would be my preference, establishes a connection that is a kind of physical physical rapport. Not just the emotional rapport that you're seeking through eye contact, by looking in people's faces, by trying to assess whether they're following you. Not just that. But rather, quite literally, the availability of my full self to you so that you can openly see who I am and how I'm trying to connect with you. This is an aspect of feng shui that many Asians would be entirely familiar with. That is, psychologists who counsel regularly are well aware you do not sit behind a desk when you are trying to establish rapport with a client. You sit across from that client. You have nothing blocking your body and theirs. There is a mind-body connection with all obstacles or blockages that occur between you and an interlocutor. Do not make your speeches any more difficult than they need to be. It is hard enough, as we stressed last time, with other distractions, with other competing interests that your readers or audience may have, whether in writing or in speaking, to maintain rapport. Because the ear is a very lazy organ by comparison with the eye. It needs to hear things repeatedly. And it does not have the advantage, unlike in reading, of being able to go back again and again and review something. Once it's heard, it's gone, and it can be lost. So don't add to the problem by creating an emotional or psychological blockage between you and the audience that is liable to reduce or eliminate rapport. These are crucial aspects of what must be understood as the advanced stage fright, the stage fright of the fearless. Because even quite sophisticated speakers who know mistake number one and don't use notes and are able to extemporize or speak impromptu in a very effective manner will often think that the size of a room or simply whatever is available there is what to use, rather than taking control of the speaking space and making it work best for you. The fact that you walk into a room and it has a podium or a lectern, and the person who's introducing you is using that, whether or not the person has notes, is no reason why you should use that podium or lectern. You're the featured speaker. You make your own decisions. But have the foresight as soon as you enter that space, and preferably beforehand, to ask about the acoustics, about the microphone possibilities, about any other 
simple technological aids that will free your body to be able to move and to establish a direct connection. You will have to acknowledge limits. For instance, our selection of this room as the speaking place for this series of iTunes lectures came after much discussion. It's only available at certain times and it has a table that is right here in front of you that is designed like this that prohibits me from easily dispensing with something between me and my audience. However, I'm keeping it at a minimum. That is, I have not brought in a lectern and at least the top half of my body is available and I'm making use of a whiteboard to give you the signposting of the major points, which is, again, part of the layout or design of this speaking space. So you may not be able to do what's absolutely ideal, but you can approach that ideal to the extent that the limitations afford. That is to say, you want as few obstacles as possible, physical and otherwise. You want as much freedom of motion as possible, both in movement via walking and in gesturing with hands. Lower body and upper body, both maximizing freedom given the limitations of your speaking space. You'll have to take into various various considerations what the advantages and disadvantages are of that speaking space. For instance, for this series of lectures, we want excellent acoustics. A more attractive speaking space that would not have this kind of obstacle at the table could be found, but at the cost of excellent acoustics. That would not be serving you, my audience. So there's a balancing act going on, and this is something that you must reflect on and negotiate with your hosts. They will often not be attuned to all of these subtle factors, and it's not their responsibility. You are the speaker. You are the one who must give the effect of speech. Not the person who introduces you. Not the person who schedules the room. Not the person who is handling the technology. It's your speech. It's you alone. It's up to you to reduce or eliminate these logistical and psychological obstacles and establish the best possible rapport with your audience based on your assessment of the overall needs of that audience. Not only the immediate audience to whom I'm speaking now, but of course, you iTunes viewers who are not physically present, but are far more numerous. I'm trying to reach you too, and in some ways, you above all, because our present audience can easily review this on iTunes as a result of this technology. So stage fright 2.0 must be assessed in light of technological issues 2.0. All of it conferring with your host in light of asking the right questions. And preferably, you do not do this at the last minute. You see, it's very unwise for a speaker, and this is also part of stage fright, because many speakers don't want to think about this. They just want to prepare their speech. They've got it all written out, or at least they have extensive notes. And then whatever room they walk into, not their choice, 
That's just the choice of my host. Don't be a lazy, fearful speaker and leave that kind of crucial decision in the hands of a scheduler. Tell the scheduler or your host what you need and prioritize and see then what's available. Given whatever your goals are in the speech. Is it the immediate audience? Is it an iTunes audience? Is it both? Gather the information. Then ask for what will approach that ideal the best. So, you see, the stage fright that is advanced stage fright masks itself as a kind of confidence. I'm all prepared. I walk into the space. I walk up to the lectern. I put down my notes or my script. And now I speak to you with utter confidence, either with my head in the script or perhaps I'm freed from that and I speak rather extemporaneously. But it's the stage fright of the fearless who are deceiving themselves that they are the fearless. Because when you throw away the resource of your body, its ability to move, its ability to gesture freely, You are confessing to that audience, I am quite willing to have some blockage between you and me and limit your ability to relate to me and have the content of the speech filtered for my personality that can be in direct contact with you. That is your confession, but it is an unconscious confession based on dependence on a lectern or a podium. And so ladies and gentlemen, it's not only important to overcome stage fright 1.0 based on excessive note taking or excessive memorization, oscillating back and forth between too much notes, no notes at all, no reliance on memory, total reliance on memory, either of one or the other, easily leads to <gasps> sudden paralysis when those notes or that memory fails. That's the stage fright 1.0. But stage fright 2.0 advanced stage fright is when you overcome those kinds of obvious fears and still are quite willing either to defer responsibility to those who are not delivering your speech or so limiting the connection between your body and their minds that you are endangering the quality of the speech by having the rapport reduced by your own choice. So as Demosthenes reminded us, the three great secrets of great public speaking. Delivery, delivery, delivery. Everything I have said to you today endorses his sage advice. If you want to make a connection and establish the deepest rapport with your audience and have them remember what you are saying on departing, Delivery, delivery, delivery. Don't succumb 
he did a simple stage fright, mistake number one, through excessive reliance on notes or on memory. And do not submit to advanced stage fright. Number two, the stage fright of the fearless by excessive reliance on a lectern or podium. If you want to return to the lectern or podium and use it as a kind of physical visual aid, that can be very effective once or twice. To go behind the podium and simply be illustrating for your audience through leaning or pulling back something that you have not done during movement once or twice that can be very effective. You see? Like referring to a whiteboard. But to refer repeatedly to the whiteboard and lose eye contact with you is not a good decision. So again, we're talking about the minimal use, not always total prohibition of the lecture or podium. It is the excessive reliance that does not assist in establishing rapport. These are criteria. There are no simple rules. Every speech is an adventure in a new experience between you and your audience. There's no recipe, there's no formula. That's the great excitement of it, that's the challenge of it, and that's what also creates the fears that you try to overcome in a false way. If you want to speak effectively, and avoid the three biggest mistakes in professional speaking. Start with the first two. 1.0, the simple stage fright. Take the improper note of your audience. Biggest mistake number two, advanced stage fright, stage fright 2.0, excessive use of your lectern or podium. Thank you for your time and consideration.